So we've got the detective, combat mage, the street samurai. Oh, you're the former company man. So these are the ones who are not. Ooh, street samurai, not selected. Okay. Okay, good. Oh, okay, the street shaman got selected. Good. I needed to make sure that he did. I actually never played a shaman before. That's okay. It'll be a learning experience. Uh, which etiquettes do you have? Uh, street and four. Fine, great. I will just make the kind of mathematical type, but I'll explain it. Okay. Actually, I'm trying to select the totem now. And the presentation. Uh, no. Well, he's got all the spells that are on that list. He does not have to choose. He has all of those spells. No, no, you have to choose. Yeah, go right ahead. Sorry, what was your question? Um, we'll fake it when the time comes. There's a chance I'll know something. Yeah. There is a spell list. He has that. Uh, one guy choosing. Uh, one question sure. about this one. We've always wondered while we played uh, this game, why does he have the air filtration system? It's never. It is never proven useful. Uh, it depends on the scenario we're in. I mean, the, the, every, the very first scenario where you come across somebody with gas grenades, you'll be very pleased you have Every time it's skin contact. Well, it depends. The game master, see, then, then you're in a game where the game master knows that you have them and is making sure that the opponents always have the ones that require skin contact. It's not fair. The, 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 the opposition shouldn't know Actually, what the players have. Actually, game master usually uses his own. You guys just do it huge amounts of really heavy duty, like combat gas. Mm-hmm. Because it's out there. I mean, it's, yeah. it's you know. Like being really Yeah. One of the things that Shadowrun, we decided for Shadowrun, the character creation system isn't balanced for everything. In certain circumstances, certain characters are just simply better than others. But they all can't do everything. That's the, that was the key. My first Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can do it. You gotta play it smart, but you you can do it. Okay. Uh, one more sure. So it wasn't like the guy cleaning his nails with his baton or anything. No. He always very safe. That's correct. But I don't. Depending for 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 this for these purposes, I'm not gonna be all over you for you know being. Okay. He, he actually acted as the Joseph. Very quick review of the game system for those of you who have been out of it for a little while and for some of the people who are. Uh, yeah. This is a pile of dice. If you don't have one, use, the, use these, but return them here because they're mine and I don't want to give them to you. Oh, sure. Fine. Be that way. I didn't know I didn't know I didn't know. Basic premise behind how the uh, attribute and skill system works in Shadowrun is that you have a rating. That rating is the number of dice that you're going to roll to do something. So if it says, uh, in this case, intelligence five, and I ask for an intelligence or a perception 
test, which is, uses intelligence dice in Shadowrun, I would pick up five dice, and I would roll them. Now, I don't care what the total dice is. What I'm interested in is what individual die result is, because I'm going to have given you a difficulty number or a target number. What you're trying to do is equal or exceed that number on as many dice as possible. So with this roll, which is a fairly average, typical roll, if the target number had been five, only one die was a five or better, I would have only one success. If, however, it had been a three, I have four dice that are a three or better, so I would have four successes. If I give you a target number that is greater than six, that means you need to roll a six, and then you get to roll that die again and add the result to try and reach the total. So let's say I'm rolling for a target number of nine. I get two sixes. Funny how I can always do that. Um, not during the game, though. Watch. I have two chances to get a nine, one of which succeeds, the other one does not. OK, this would have been a 12. This would have been an 8. So this is not a success. This is. It doesn't matter by how much you beat the target number, just that you did. So there's no reason to keep rolling if you keep getting sixes. It doesn't matter. You just need to beat it. Now, we also have something we call a pool. Pools are used. This is different in second edition. Pools are um, combat pools, magic pools, and so on. There used to be a dodge pool under first edition that has been um, now that is now included in the combat pool. A, a dice pool is literally that. It is a pool of dice that you can draw from. So let's say this character he doesn't, but let's say or does he? Well, this one's got a lot. Let's pretend he's got a dice pool of five dice. We'll just make a pool of dice. There it is. I now go into a combat situation. I have five combat pool dice. When I choose to attack someone, I can choose, I can take dice from this pool to use for that attack. Or I can keep them there and use them to protect myself if someone attacks me. The trick is, if I use the dice, they're not there anymore. So if I use three dice for my attack, now there's only two. That means I can only use two to defend myself. The dice comes back into your pool at the start of every action. So whenever you have a new action, you get a new set of dice. OK? Um, combat pool dice can either be used to attack or defend yourself. Magic pool dice can be used to increase the effectiveness of a spell cast at someone else or to um, protect yourself or protect your friends from magical attack. They can also be used to reduce what is known as the drain of a spell. I'll explain that in a second. Um, are we doubling all drain? We're using the straight numbers. We're using the straight numbers. Uh, I don't want to play with variant rules and, and stuff. And there's, there's too many people who don't who are watching who don't know the game. So I'll just we'll just stick straight. Um, magic is the unique thing about the Shadowrun world. It has a couple of rules that make it very different from a lot of other games. First off, if you know a spell, you can cast it. There is no arbitrary limitation on the number of times you can cast a spell. The limitation is that every time you cast is that every time you cast the spell, there's a chance you get tired from it. That's what we call the drain. All right? And every time you cast the spell, you have to make a, a, a resistance test yourself to see if you become tired or not. You have to uh, check for the drain only in case of uh, if, you don't, if you fail the uh, spell. Yes, yeah, so you have to check for drain regardless of whether you succeed or fail. Um, the other things that are different about the Shadowrun magic system it is line of sight in most cases, which basically means I'm going to cast a spell. My target is actually sitting on the floor on the far side of this group of people. If I can't see him, most spells that I know can't hurt him. It's a, it's a metaphysical thing where I have to, where I am um, sinking the, my magical aura and the magic of the, the, the spell with his aura so it can affect him. If I don't actually have a line of sight to his aura, I can't do it. Now, there are spells. Um, 
manipulation spells, which are basically just, I take a gob of energy and I kind of loft it over the top of these people, it drops down and explodes, not caring who's there. Um, okay. uh, have a Pepsi, but I will trade it for the Coke. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, it's a little it's a little more complicated than that if it comes up we'll get into it but it's an important thing to realize there is also no range limitation on spells so that if you can see them you can hit them the joke has always been if i get an optical telescope and i look through it and i see some guy on the moon who waves at me i can hit him with a spell much to his surprise <laughs> Uh, it will, it will, that's actually a really good question. Uh, we'll ignore that for now. Just, uh, esoteric involved in the background of Shadowrun. Don't need to bring it up before, before everybody else. Yeah. Um, magic, however, will not work through artificial means. Meaning, if I look at somebody on the television set and he's being broadcast to that by a video camera in the other room, I can't affect him. Even though I can see him, it's, it's an artificial image. If by some chance it were some fiber optic projected image that never actually gets translated to something else, then I could have hit him, much to his surprise. So what you'll find in corporations or high security si situations are fiber optic imaging systems where a security mage sits at a console with a headset that has fiber optics running out, out of it that are then fed through the building to lens systems in various positions. And he uses prisms or something like that, mirrors, to toggle through each of them to see the different parts of the buildings and different parts of the grounds. Because then he can see, the, if he can directly see the guy, the light that is hitting the guy is the light that hits my eye, I can target him. So it's a little different. Um, how combat and spell casting works. I have given you, let's, it's looking at gun combat first. I am shooting you, no offense. Um, we, well, there is a target number, which is the difficulty, which comes from the range between the two of us and the weapon that I'm using. Longer range weapons have better target numbers at longer ranges pretty much makes sense. There are other modifiers, like if all these people stand up, he has cover. It's harder for me to see him. If there's a lot of smoke, it's harder for me to see him. If it's dark, there's, it's harder for me to see him, so on and so forth. If I have cyberware that puts a little targeting crosshair in my eye and tells me exactly where my gun is pointed at this particular moment, life is easier for me. Worse for him. And worse for him, exactly. Recoil, multiple shots make it harder, so on and so forth. But let's say for the sake of argument, I have my target number of four, which is about average, about average. It also means that if I'm here and he's there, my target number is a four, something is really wrong in the universe because it should be like a two, which is the minimum target number, because, well, I could reach out and smack him with my hand. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm really hurt. That must be it. Um, so it's a target number of four. I am going to now roll the hit, all right? Let's say I have a skill of four, I have a combat pool dice of five. The maximum number of additional dice from my combat pool that I can use is four, because that's my skill. That's a rule. So I roll them, and I suck. Um, I actually got three successes, okay? Now what happens, he's getting shot at, he gets to defend. This is where it's a little different from first edition, all right? He's going to defend with his body, his physical toughness. He rolls his dice against a difficulty number, which is based on the power of the gun that I'm shooting and the armor that he's wearing. The more powerful the gun, yeah, you're in trouble. The, but then again, I have an invisible gun. Um, the more powerful the gun, the higher his target number. The higher his armor, the lower my, his target number. Basically, the, the, the gun has a number from which you subtract the rating of the armor. All right, he rolls his body dice, he gets a bunch of successes. We compare the success works a little different. I won't go in again into the super details, but basically I have spell casting dice, which work like my attack dice for a skill, for a gun, 
I roll those dice. The target number, again, you, sorry, nothing personal, uh, is based on the kind of spell. If it's a mental attack spell, then it is his uh, willpower. If it is a physical attack spell, it is his body, his toughness. Uh, I get my successes. He rolls his defensive defense, either willpower or body, if he's just a mundane. If he's also a magician, he can throw in dice from his magic pool. So it's really hard for a magician to affect another magician. He gets his successes. The big difference here is if he has better successes, more equal, more successes than I do, the spell doesn't affect him at all. He shrugs it off. If, however, I have more successes than he does, he eats the full strength of the spell. Only certain spells does he get, then get to stage down. So it's an all or nothing circumstance, which makes it very dangerous. No more of the saves and takes out that stuff. No, no, no more of that stuff. Um, guns and uh, spells that do damage are rated either by doing light, moderate, serious, or deadly. This is the condition monitor for Shadowrun. You'll notice there's a stun and a physical damage track. Stun is bruising, beating, fatigue damage. Physical is, oh god, oh god, he's broken a bone kind of damage. Um, if you take a light wound, either stun or physical, you take one box of damage. A moderate wound, you take three boxes of damage. Serious wound, six boxes of damage. Deadly wound, fill in all ten. Damage is, of course, cumulative, so if I already have a moderate wound, three boxes, and I take another moderate wound, I am now seriously damaged. Okay? D the damage states modify how well you do, th they modify your target numbers when you try and do something. Also, if you take too much stun damage, it whips around into physical. So it is possible to beat somebody to death with stun damage. It's just hard to do it. They fall on conscious. They fall standing and just keep hitting them. You can do it. Or, in some cases, if you just hit them hard enough, although the second edition rules, because they are deadlier, it is really hard to kill somebody in one shot. Okay, that's just a game balance thing. Just because it sucks being a player and you're walking down the street and suddenly the bullet out of nowhere and you're dead. This way in Shadowrun, it takes two shots minimum, although it has been done, um, to, if you're only using the optional rules, under the basic rules, it takes two shots minimum to kill somebody. Yeah. Um, in the, there are advanced rules, which, uh, which translates usually into more complicated rules, uh, where really, really powerful hits can kill somebody. Because, yeah, technically, using the basic damage, I could jump off the, the, the tallest building in the world and hit the ground, but because the maximum damage I can take under the basic rules is deadly, I'm not quite dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's a player character survival thing, um, which Game Masters can, of course, just say, no, 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 I want to see them dropping like flies. Um, lastly, initiative. As was stated earlier, who goes first is really damn important. Because while this is a modern combat game, even though it uses magic, and like a lot of forms of modern combat, the guy who shoots first usually wins. Um, so you s should spend a lot more time maneuvering to get that shot rather than uh, deciding, oh, you know, I'm just going to walk into this combat. I'll get the second or third shot. That should be OK. It's not going to work that way. Certain characters have a definite, definite advantage, not definitive, definite advantage in combat. Those are the guys with wired reflexes. There are little cybernetic computers at the base of their necks and wired through their nervous system that keep them going much faster and cutting down their reaction times than everybody else. Again, in the more advanced rules, you've got to worry about those guys because they're really edgy. They can just overreact at the the merest sound, but we're not going to worry about that. Now, each character sheet has an initiative rating. There it is. It's a number plus a, plus a number of D6s. The number is based on your attributes. The D6 is based on the, the, whether or not you have cybernetics. So this guy, for example, he has a base 4 plus 1 D6. Um, what is the company man's dice? I have 8 plus 3 D6. 8 plus 3 D6 big difference there, okay? He's going to be going, say, around 24 to 27 is his maximum. This guy, he's going to be lucky if he hits a 10. Now, what that means, because we count down from the highest, you get an additional action every 10 combat phases. 
So let's say he gets his 27. He gets an action on 27, 17, and 7. If this poor guy wimps out on his die roll, he doesn't go till 5. He goes three times before he does. Which makes him really dangerous in that circumstance. However, there are things, magic and stuff, that this guy has that can offset that, that can make him move faster, that can make him pay if he doesn't die. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but again, the most important thing to remember is you roll your dice, you total it up every 10 phases. That's different from first edition, which was every seven phases. Um, also, your dice pools that I mentioned before, you get them back every action, which is the other deadly thing. Think about it. Mr. Uh, former Company Man is shooting at Mr. Combat Mage. 27, he gets his full pile of dice. All right, I shoot him. I use them all, or as many as he can, and as many multiple shots as he wants to. 17 comes. He gets them all back again. Now, my poor Combat Mage, I've only got this set of dice to use. So on 27, I use two of them. And 17 comes, and I haven't gotten any back yet. But he's gotten all of his back yet. I use two more. Seven comes. I still don't have any left. Get any back. He's got them all again. Uh, take him one more. I'm still alive when five comes. Now I get them all back. Now you pay. Because <laughs> you've used all of yours. Because he's now probably used all or a bunch of his from seven. They do not regenerate this turn because seven minus ten is, well, a negative number, so it doesn't count. Um, you know, I get my one shot at him, one action. If I don't kill him, well, he goes on 27 again next time. And uh, I'm SOL, as they say. Zero, zero is no, there is no phase on zero. Correct. So if you get 10, you sit there and go, damn! Because you only get one action. Um, that's basically it. That's basically it. Okay. Um, any questions? I mean, you, you guys have all played, so yeah, you're, you're, I'm gonna fake it when the time comes in the scenario. Um, you understood the differences between first and second edition? The biggest thing is not to let your instincts about first edition combat system color your actions, color your actions. correct. Correct. Because you will do the, oh, that guy's only got a light pistol. All right, I'm just going to walk up to him slowly. No, he, that's, even though it's a light pistol. Did you mention the thing about the uh, no more different staging numbers? Oh, that's a good point. Um, in first edition, you used to have different staging numbers, like one, two, three, and four. All staging numbers are now two. We just don't worry about it. That game, part of the game system just never worked right. Um, Again, 60 versus 60,000 playtesters. When 60,000 go, this is stupid, you go, okay, <laughs> all right, we'll fix that. Sorry. Oh, yeah. What about the surprise attack? So if you are surprised, can you use your uh, uh, dice? If you are officially surprised, no, you cannot. Okay. And you'll lose an action, you lose the ability to react in certain circumstances, so on and so forth. Um, okay, I am going to make make my usual convention game declaration, which is, you all, as characters, know each other. You have worked before. You have worked before as a team. You trust each other. <laughs> Which basically means you trust each other enough so that if one of you turns your back, you're not worried about the other guy just putting a bullet in your head for the hell of it. <laughs> and then taking your stuff. Um, which does not mean that if somebody does something really stupid during the game, you can't react appropriately. Please do. But you guys have worked together, you are professionals, you are a team. Okay. I'll just bang on this a couple more times. It should be picking up most of the voices from where it is. It's going to be hard to... 
to pass it around, but it should be picking up most of the voices. Um, we'll just try and talk louder. That's it. That'll help. Okay. Use the duct tape to actually tape it to itself. Um, it is Seattle. Not to your yeah, I was about to say not to your surprise, it's raining. It is not, however, a driving rain. It's just a warm mist, which is actually a good alternative to what you've had since winter is now slowly becoming spring. Warm air has moved up the Pacific Pacific coast, colliding with the cold air from the Canadian Rockies that had dominated the area. There is a heavy fog throughout the city as a result. Again, you're not particularly surprised. It is warm. For many people, this is the first time they're going to be coming out into the daylight, such as it is, uh, for months. So you're seeing the beginnings of a renewed cycle of life in the city. One of you, and let's see, there are six players. You, you're the, you're the shaman, it shouldn't be you. <laughs> you, <laughs> um, long ago, before you began working with this fine bunch of individuals, who have yet to prove themselves. Um, you worked with a gentleman named Hayes. At least that's the name he worked with, under. On a run, he made a mistake and uh, paid for it with his life. You've sort of been guilt, you were guilt ridden for a time over that incident because you thought there were things that you could have done, perhaps if you'd been paying more attention, if you'd been faster, if, there have been more bullets in your clip, so on and so forth. You have a whole list of things that you beat yourself, uh, or used to beat yourself continually with, about that incident. Um, the hardest part was the fact that he left behind a wife and daughter. You vowed at the time that you would keep an eye on them, at least for a while, until they started to get their act together. They did, or the mother certainly did, not exactly in the way you would have hoped. She's become a uh, corporate secretary. And being a former company, company man, you know the, uh, the bad things that can come from that. Let's just phrase it that way. Um, you, can't, you can't find it in yourself, though, to, to uh, ask her not to do that because she has to support herself and her daughter. So instead, what you found yourself doing is unconsciously drifting away from them. Uh, also for reasons of your own security, your own safety, and hers. Because if she got a promotion high enough where they say did a background check on her, they might find out about her connection to you. Which, big trouble on both sides, on both sides. exactly. So by separating yourself from them, you hope you may be able to protect them, and at the same time, you don't have to deal with the um, collision of values that's occurring. Um, in fact, you drift so far away, you don't hear from them for a time. Uh, the daughter has, well, last night, you received a message um, from the woman. Her name is Madeline. Uh, I'll ask you if you want to take notes and stuff that's cool, uh, don't write on these sheets. Because as we saw with the bodyguard sheet, we wouldn't want one of the players later to flip it over and go, oh, hey, the guy with the red beret did it. You know, uh, or whatever. No guys with red berets in the adventure, so don't, don't be writing that down. Um, and it was sort of a, it was a, a, a voicemail message very hesitant, almost reluctant 
to disturb you, to bother you. And the message stated that her daughter, Ellen, has disappeared. She can't find her. She's apparently been missing for a few days. And what little you can glean from the message and from your own experience with the corporations, it sounds as, as though, no, Ellen's, the reason that, that she's been missing for a few days and the mother's only just realized it is whenever the mother was home, she didn't reasonably necessarily expect the daughter to be there as well. You know, they're basically passing, their schedules were passing. And at one point, she realized that, you know, I haven't actually seen her in a couple of days. The girl, you know, was pretty self-sufficient. So it wasn't like she was, you know, sitting around waiting for mom to make dinner or anything like that. But she said, you know, I haven't seen her for a few days. I haven't seen any sign <coughs> that she's been here. She apparently did some checking and determined that some of her stuff is missing. She doesn't go into details in the message, but basically asks if you and anybody you know could look into it. She doesn't have a lot of money. She can perhaps manage something, but she needs your help. Apparently, and this just grates at you because of your background, she's currently, things are occurring in the department that she works for at the corporation, and she is currently in line for a promotion in that, de in that department. So